What if everything you know is wrong? And the reason I say that is because science keeps telling us that. Science keeps telling us that the way we see the world is not right. There's another way to look at it when you put on scientific eyes. And you can do this yourself. Go outside and look at the Earth. And what does it look like? What do you see if you just go and look at the Earth? Well, you see something that looks kind of, kind of flat. I mean, the, you know, this floor is flat. The street outside is pretty flat. Walk around, the Earth looks kind of flat. Sure, you might see a mountain. But on the other side, there will be a valley. If you push the mountains down, the valleys come out, it's flat. If you take a walk in any direction and just keep on going, you will come to an ocean. Go east, you get to the Atlantic. Go west, you get to the Pacific. Go north, you get to the Arctic. Go south, you get to the Antarctic. So it looks like we live on an island surrounded by an ocean. And when you stand on the seashore and you look out over the ocean, what do you see? You see a sharp line on the horizon. It looks like an edge you could fall over. And if we don't have boats, you can't get to that edge. It's too far to swim. And the sky, what's it look like? It looks like a blue dome over our head with the sun stuck on it. And this blue dome is black on the other side and it rotates around. And when the black side comes around, it's got stars and the moon stuck on it. And it rotates around us this way. That's what the world looks like to our eyes. That is wrong. But a thousand years ago, that was a perfectly valid model of the universe. And it took a lot of science, a lot of mathematics, a lot of engineering, and a lot of technology to figure out that we live on a ball. We live on a ball. It doesn't look like a ball. And it doesn't seem to move. This ball that we live on moves a lot. So there are stars under your feet right now. There is empty space under your feet. Go 12,000 kilometers down, you come to empty space. A lot of it. Just as much as there is in that direction. We live, and by the way, uh, you live uh, here. There's Toronto on our world. We're not at the top, we're not in the middle, we're not on the bottom, we're sort of three quarters of the way up. And this thing moves. By the way, uh, this globe that I have, uh, it doesn't have any political markings on it. And it's based on satellite photos, which is why I like it. When I was born, and I'm not that old, when I was a kid, we didn't know this. We did not know what the Earth looked like because we didn't have satellites to take pictures. The space age hadn't even happened yet. And again, I'm not that old. I dye my hair gray. Okay, <laughs> okay so this thing moves. First of all, we had to figure out it was a ball. We had to develop ships. Then we had to develop the compass. Then we had to develop clocks so that we could navigate out of sight of land. Then we had to develop airplanes to fly around it and finally rockets to get off the thing and have a look at it from, from a distance. That took a lot. And we found out that this thing did. So here's one thing the Earth does. It turns like this, right? Every day, think about this. Since yesterday, you have been all the way around the world because the Earth took you with it as it turned. That's a big trip. That's a long way to go. And in fact, uh, Toronto, in order to get all the way around the world, has to travel quite quickly. We are moving about 800 kilometers an hour. That's about the speed of a jet airliner. And the Earth turns counterclockwise, so we're going towards the east, which is that way. So right now, you are moving 800 kilometers an hour around the center of the Earth in that direction. So if the Earth was to suddenly stop turning, all of us would hit that wall at 800 kilometers an hour. <laughs> Not only that, uh, if you go to the equator, you're traveling faster because you have a bigger circle. You have farther to go <clears throat> than you do when you're up near the pole. If you stand on the equator, you're doing 1,600 kilometers an hour. That's supersonic. That's an F-18 jet. So you're traveling as fast as a fighter jet just by standing on a beach in Brazil. Standing on a beach, you're traveling faster than a fighter jet. That's not all. The Earth, in addition to doing that, is whipping around the sun. Every year we have to make a trip around the sun. That's a long way to go in only a year. And to do that, the Earth is moving at about just a little over 100,000 kilometers an hour. 100,000 kilometers an hour. That's faster than the space shuttle. We are moving faster than a rocket. Every second, we cover 30 kilometers. Every second. That's about the width of Toronto. Every second. You go from Mississauga to Scarborough. Every second. Boop, boop, 
We just did it. That's how fast the Earth is moving through space. Okay? We're cooking, man. We're cooking. And in fact, I think that's why we don't have time travel. Because if you even went back to yesterday, the Earth wasn't here. <laughs> the Earth has moved since yesterday. If you went back to yesterday, you'd be out in empty space. You'd, you'd be going, where the hell's the Earth? It was here a second ago. And if you went back far in time, like back to, I don't know, uh, the, the dinosaurs or something, you'd have to go a long, long way because the Earth has traveled a lot since then. So maybe that's all these tourists from the future are all out lost in space somewhere. That's why they're not here. So time travel is a problem. Uh, that's the reason. And by the way, you can figure that out our direction because right now, uh, okay, that's east. The sun rises in the east, goes across the sky like that, and sets in the west, right? So it's, what is it, um, 11 o'clock or so? So the sun's probably about there. And if you, if you make an L with your, your hands and you put, <clears throat> put your left hand towards the sun, that's the direction we're going at. So we're moving in that direction. That, that's the way the Earth's going at this 100,000 kilometers an hour. That'll change during the day. By the way, I had an experience. I was in Africa. Oh, my other message? Go look at this. Go look at this. Get off North America. Buy a ticket to anywhere and go look at the rest of the world. This is really great. When I was uh, in my late 20s, I, I saved up my pennies and I went all the way around the world by myself just to see what it looks like. Best thing I ever did. You know what I found? <laughs> I haven't seen the Earth yet. There's a whole lot to see. There's a whole lot to see. Anyway, I was here in Africa and I was thinking about the fact that I was on the side of the Earth. And I worked out all this stuff about which way it was moving at that time. It was at night. And it turned out that I was on the back side of the Earth, like this. As it's really, so I've, and I was lying on a hill. And it was at night. And a beautiful African sky with all the stars all the way to the horizon. No moon. Milky Way was fabulous. I'm lying on this hill. And I started thinking about the fact that I'm on the side of the planet. And that the Earth is going this way. And I started sliding down the hill. Because the Earth was now behind me. Not below me. It was behind me. And I'm, I'm like this fly on the wall. And I thought, man, if I let go, the earth is going to go flying off and I'm going to be left out here in space. It was a very spooky event. And I wasn't smoking anything. <laughs> Science can do that to you. It does that to you. So we had to figure all this out. It's amazing that we know this. We know that we live on a ball and that this ball moves. We used to think we were in the center of the universe because it looks like everything goes around us. Science said, no, that's wrong. We're not. This earth moves. It goes around the sun. A fellow named Galileo got into a lot of trouble for saying that when he told the Pope. He got into a lot of trouble because they said, no, no, that can't be right. And then we thought the sun was at the center. They said, no, nope, it moves. It moves. It goes around our galaxy. Our galaxy is not the center. It's part of this. And the universe is expanding. And you know what we found out? We thought we had it all figured out. We're so smart. OK, we know about planets. We know about stars. We know about galaxies. We know about the universe. Then they found this stuff called dark matter. They found out there's, there's stuff out there that we don't see. We know it's there, but we don't see it. You know why they call it dark? They haven't got a clue what it is. We don't know what it is. It makes up a quarter of the universe is dark matter. Then they found there's this other stuff pushing the universe apart called dark energy. And you know why they call it dark? They don't know what it is. That makes up 75% of the universe. So <laughs> something like 95% of our universe is made of stuff that we don't know. In 2010, most of the universe is unknown to us. And the stuff that we're made of, the stuff that you're made of, the atoms, the molecules, and all that, that's a small, small part of what the total universe is about. The point? Our ignorance is greater than our knowledge. What we don't know far exceeds what we do know. And it's not just in space. It's not just in space. It's in biology, too. How does life start? How did life start on this planet? How did it get going here? How did you go from chemicals in some primordial soup, turn into something that is alive, that can reproduce itself, that can eventually start thinking about the fact that it's alive? How did that happen? We don't know. What's a thought? Where's your memory? You know, they don't know where memory is in your head. When you, when you think about something, they put people in these scanners. They say, okay, think about uh, your first kiss. You go, ooh. There's no one spot in your head that lights up. It's not like you have a hard drive with all your memories in it that goes, oh, first kiss, bing, pull it out. Mm, wasn't that fun? 
It doesn't work like that. Your whole brain goes crazy. And they have no idea how that works. We don't know how the brain remembers. And yet your life is in your head. My life is in my head. We don't know how that works. So what we don't know far exceeds what we do know. And that is good. That doesn't mean that we're stupid. It doesn't mean that we're stupid. It means we got some work to do. We got some work to do. And that's why science is a good way of looking at the world. I'm not saying you should all become scientists. But at least know a little bit about science so that when we have to make some hard decisions like uh, climate change, we know this thing is changing about where's our food going to come from, where's our water going to come from, how many of us are there, how do we turn wheels, how do we get ourselves from here to there. Having a little bit of science background really helps because we've got to make those decisions. So whether you're a business person or you're a politician or whatever it is that you choose to do, understanding some fundamentals about science is really helpful. And I'm just going to, I just got just a couple minutes left. I want to give you one other example of how science can change the way you see things. What are you looking at right now? You're looking at a guy talking. And hopefully you're understanding what I'm saying. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, but what are you really seeing? So just try to think of how many different areas of science I'm going to mention in about the next minute. Okay? So what you're looking at here is a specimen of Homo sapiens sapien. Not the best specimen, but one that's bipedal. A species that hasn't been around very long on this planet. We're uh, less than 100,000 years. But this whole homo genius goes back about 6 million. And that was when somebody got an idea. Let's change the way we get around from being quadrupeds to bipeds. <laughs> ah! Hands. What are we going to do with that? Oh, a horizon. Let's go there. This homo sapien is uh, taking air in and out of lungs that are in the chest. And as the air goes in and out, it's exchanging oxygen in the air for carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is actually affecting our atmosphere. When the air comes out of the lungs, it goes up the trachea, and it's being stopped by two little membranes in the throat. And they stop the air, but they can't hold on to it, and the pressure builds up. And the pressure builds up, and it goes, Pah! and then they slam shut. And then the pressure builds up again, and it goes, Pah! and then they slam shut. And they're doing this. Again and again and again, thousands of times per second, go ba 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 These are making little pressure waves in the air that are coming out the front of this cranium and going out here into the air. Most of them are getting lost, just turning into heat, but some of them are hitting this thing here. This microphone has a little crystal in it, and when the airwaves pressure hits it, this crystal deforms a little bit, makes a little electric voltage that goes down a wire and comes to this thing here, which is a radio transmitter. This is making radio waves that are coming out of this little antenna there that are radiating out in this room at the speed of light. And at the back of the room, there's an antenna. When those radio waves hit it, the uh, electrons in the antenna sort of go up and down like that, and they make another voltage that goes through wires and going up into the ceiling. And there are speakers here somewhere, these big black things. And they've got big disks in them. And these disks are being pushed back and forth like this by big magnets. And they're going back and forth at exactly the same frequency as these things in my throat that are doing that. And they're making these big shock waves in the air that are coming out at Mach 1. And they're hitting you in the head. And when they hit you in the head, they go into two holes you have in the side of your head. And in there you have these little drums that are going in and out like this on those shock waves. And they're going in and out at exactly the same frequency as the speakers are doing that and my throat's doing <laughs> And when they do, there are three little bones that connect to organs in your head called cochlea, which look like seashells. And by the way, the spiral shape of those seashells is exactly the same mathematical shape as our Milky Way galaxy. Nature preserves scale. Inside these little seashells are liquids. And in the liquid are little tiny hairs. And these little tiny hairs are shaken. And they're shaken at the same frequency as the speakers and the... And, 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 and there are nerves, and they're making these electrochemical uh, chain reactions that are going up into your audio cortex in your brain. And they are somehow, through a process we do not understand, making a thought. And all of that's happening to you as you stand here watching a guy talk. So what did I mention? I mentioned anthropology, paleoanthropology, chemistry, physics, otolaryngology, audiology, electronics. Um, and uh, uh, neurology and physiology. All of that while you stand here and watch me talk to you. 
That's why I find science talk uh, interesting. It changes the world. It changes the way you see the world. And the world is really interesting when you see it in exquisite detail through scientific eyes. So if you want to go into that field, do it. If you don't want to go into the field, take an interest in it and just learn a little bit about it because the world is a whole lot more interesting and there's so much we don't know that it's really fascinating to study. So I wish you well today. Have a great time and go see the world. Okay? Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>